Good morning, everybody. Today we are going to talk about the InVision protocols on your Neurocom system. These are the dynamic visual acuity and gaze stability tests. And we're doing these because these are tests that are really important to quantify patient's ability to see with their head moving. And we do have some clinical tests that we do for this. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with the test that we do with the Snellen chart, the clinical dynamic visual acu acuity chart, where we, um, we have the patient just read the Snellen chart, and then we have them read it again with head movement to see how their vision changes when we add head movement to that test. But there are some limitations to that test. For example, one limitation is that it doesn't discriminate if there's a problem um, on one side, you can't tell from that test which side the problem is on. The other limitation to that test is that if the patient is having difficulty seeing the, s the chart, what's their natural um, tendency to do? If they're having trouble seeing and you're their natural tendency is going to be to slow their head down. And what will that allow them to do? Focus and cheat on the test. Okay? So we have the ability now, we've computerized this test so that the optotype will only appear if the patient reaches the threshold velocity, so we can control speed. The computer will also allow us to see which side the patient is having difficulty towards. So if the patient has, for example, a unilateral vestibular problem, and it's on the right-hand side, the computer knows that the optotype is showing up during the sweep to the right, and it'll be able to discriminate the patient's score on the right side versus the left side. So it gives us a lot more information than we have from just the clinical test. So Jason's our volunteer today. Thank you, Jason, for volunteering. We're going to set up the test, and in order to make sure that Jason is positioned appropriately, we have to be able to measure how far away he is from the screen, because the computer will present the optotype based on his distance away from the screen. Jason, is this straight on for you? Are you seeing it pretty clearly? Okay. So I'm going to go in here, and I am going to start. Jason, I'm just going to use a test file for him <coughs> today. And you'll notice that when you go into the main menu, you have some choices. I'm going to pick the dynamic vision option because that's going to give me the InVision protocol. And when I click on assessment, I have three choices. Perception time, always has to be done first. The perception time is your baseline test. You have to do it before you do any in-vision testing because it's going to give you the patient's static visual acuity, which is what you need to compare to the dynamic. And it's also going to give you a result called perception time, which means how quickly can a patient perceive a visual image. Okay, so we're going to do that first. I like to do dynamic visual acuity second because dynamic visual acuity is an easier test for both the patient and the operator because in dynamic visual acuity, the head velocity stays constant throughout the whole test. And then the third one we're going to do is the gaze stabilization test. I'm going to click on continue. And you'll notice that I can choose the test distance. How far away is the patient from the screen. The computer needs to know this because it adjusts the size of the optotype based on the distance away. I measured the distance. The distance right now is six feet. The minimum distance is five feet away. The, and then you can go as far as 12 feet away. Um, a lot of clinics have space constraints, and so you can have the patient sit as close as five feet away from the screen. I'm going to save that setting and click on continue. The first test that comes up is static visual acuity. This is just our baseline test. Now you all can see the big screen over here. I'm going to have Jason focus on this little screen 
and you're not allowed to look at the big screen. <laughs> All right. Um, when I click on the start button, you'll see that the patient gets an attentional cue. This focuses their attention on one part of the monitor so that they know where the optotype is going to show up. My instructions to the patient are, Jason, I want you to look at that circle. Keep your eyes focused there. An E is going to show up in that circle, a capital E. The legs of the E are either going to be facing up, down, right, or left. I want you to tell me which direction the legs are pointing. I do not want you to guess. If you don't know, I want you to say, I don't know. Okay? The reason that I don't want Jason to guess on this test is this is his static visual acuity baseline. And people tend to get competitive about this, and they want to squint and strain and see the smallest E that they can. If he guesses and guesses correctly, I'm going to have an inaccurate baseline and it's going to impact his score when we move to static visual acuity. So I really need to encourage him not to guess. Okay? Do you understand what we're doing, Jason? Yes. All right. So when I click on the mouse button, the test is going to start. Okay? I click on the mouse button. Okay, so Jason said left, which is correct. So my, as the operator, on my mouse, on my remote mouse, I am going to input the answer that he gave. And I need to be very careful that I'm inputting his answer and I'm not inputting what I saw on the screen. Because let's say he got the first one wrong. If he got it wrong and I input the correct answer, the computer will never know that he got the answer wrong. So I need to be really careful, put his answer in, because if he gets the answer wrong, the computer's going to make the E bigger for the next one. If he gets it right, the computer's going to make the E smaller. Okay? So what did he say? Left. Okay? And on my mouse, I can, put, I can click on the left arrow. As soon as I click on this, the computer's going to advance to the next optotype. And did you see that the E got smaller? Okay, did you see that on the bottom of the screen it says 0.1 logmar? Logmar is the way that we are measuring visual acuity. It's equivalent to Snellen. 0.1 logmar is one line bigger than 2020. 0, 0.0 logmar is 2020 vision. Minus 0.1 logmar is one line smaller than 2020. So logmar is actually a lot easier than Snellen because we can um, measure line by line by line instead of 2013, 2015, 2025. Okay. Now what was his answer to that one? Right? Okay. Next one. Okay. So he said, I don't know. If the patient doesn't know the answer, we put in the space bar. There is a space bar option on your, of course, you can be using your, your keyboard to do this, but on the mouse, you have an option for space bar. Okay, so I'm going to press space bar. He's at minus 0.3 logmar right now, which is the smallest that the computer can, um, can go. Left. Left. He doesn't know, so I'm going to put <coughs> space bar. So the good news is I can't see that either, so there's no risk of me putting in the wrong <laughs> answer. Space bar. So that's it. We've just collected his static visual acuity. His static visual acuity is minus 0.18 logmar, which is 1.8 lines better than 2020 vision. Now, Jason might say to me, you know, my optometrist told me that my vision was blah, blah, blah. This is not a calibrated visual acuity assessment like you would get at the optometrist's office. This is a baseline that I'm going to use to compare to his, head, to his vision when I start moving his head. So um, I work very closely with an OT, and she gets mad when I say, I don't really care what his static acuity is. I just need a 
baseline because I want to see how it changes when I add head movement. Okay? All right, so that's, that's good. How are you doing? Do you need a break or anything? You good? Okay. Maximum. Yes, question. The question was, how big can it get if you've got a patient? And this is, a, this is an important question because a lot of us wear glasses, right? Think about your patients that wear prism lenses and they start moving their head and the prism can actually be affected by that. So you will be making some clinical judgments. Also, your patients that have um, lenses that are like no-line bifocals or no-line trifocals, you're going to be making some clinical judgments. Do I want to test them with their glasses on or their glasses off? So once we're done here, I can show you how big it goes. Um, but off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Okay. okay, so you can see now on the screen that perception will be the next test. This is the perception time test. So what the computer is going to do, the optotype is going to stay the same size and it's going to be bigger than minus 0.18 logmar. We want to take out the variability of acuity for this one, make sure the optotype is big enough that we're sure he can see it, and then we're going to flash the optotype as fast as we can and see if he can perceive it. Because we know visual perception is not instantaneous, right? The visual object has to come onto the retina, go back to the visual cortex, and then be processed. So there's a time delay there. What types of patients might have a longer time delay than others for that type of process? Brain injury, definitely. Also patients that are on any kind of central nervous system depressant medication. Okay. All right, so we're going to click the start button. Jason's going to get another attentional cue. Do you see how, how small that square is now? Okay. The optotype is going to be much smaller than when it started on the other test, but it's still going to be bigger than what we know his static acuity is. Jason, what's going to happen now is the E is going to appear just like last time, but it's going to not be on the screen for a very long period of time. Okay? But your job is the same. Just tell me the direction of the, the legs of the E. Are you ready? Okay. When I click on the mouse button, it's going to start. So the optotype was on the screen for 250 milliseconds. Okay? And he said down. And that one was 150 milliseconds. So it's getting faster. That one was 80 milliseconds. Now, some, some um, people have asked, well, Kevi, what if you're not inputting the, the answer fast enough? It has nothing to do with how fast I input the answer or how fast Jason gives the answer. It's only about how long the optotype is on the screen. Okay? Um, so that one was 80 milliseconds. Does anybody remember what the answer was? Thank you. What I would normally do if I'm talking or giving my patient a break is I would put my thumb over the answer so that I know that, because as soon as I press it, it's going to go again. Okay, you ready? 20 milliseconds. This is the fastest that the optotype can be presented. So that is done. Okay, that's perception time. Um, I'm obviously taking a lot of time to talk to you and explain, so this is taking a longer time than it would in the clinic. But we do have, we always have the ability to give the patient a rest if they need it by just not clicking their answer until they're ready to go on to the next one. His perception time is normal, 20 milliseconds. Anything between 20 and, mil and 50 milliseconds is normal. Um, when I first got this technology in my clinic, I tested everybody that worked in my building. That was about 50 people. And I really got familiar with the testing protocols. I got comfortable with what's normal, what's not normal. I highly recommend that you take some time and test the normal people that you work with because it'll give you a nice baseline for what to expect and it'll help you feel very confident as you're giving the test to your, to your patients. So I have the ability to close the test now. I'm going to say yes to that. If, if Jason was having any eye strain, headache, dizziness, I could note that in the comment section. Also, if Jason wore glasses or had a visual correction of any kind, I would note that, and I would note that if he was tested with correction or without correction. So now we're going to initialize the head tracker. So to do that, I'm just going to put it on a 
flat surface. I need to make sure I have enough cable to reach the patient. I'm going to initialize the tracker. This is the way that the computer knows how fast Jason's head is moving and which direction his head is moving. You'll notice that I can test the patient in three directions. I can test them in horizontal, vertical, and roll. As a refresher, what's this movement called? Yaw. What's this movement called? Pitch. And this movement? Roll. Okay. And what you'll notice is if you test in yaw, horizontal, the threshold velocity is fast. It's 85 degrees per second. If you test in pitch or in roll, the threshold velocity drops down and is slower because we don't move as quickly in these, in these other planes. All right. So I like our threshold velocity. It defaults to 85 degrees per second. I'm going to leave it just like that. It saved our distance of six feet. I'm going to save that, and I'm going to test him in horizontal. So when I click on Continue, I have the option to practice or go right into the test. It's critical for the patient that you give practice. Um, from the validation studies that were done, it's really necessary to give practice to smooth out the consistency of your results. So you'll see that practice is highlighted. You'll also see at the top right-hand side of the screen that the computer has brought forward his static visual acuity. So we know what his vision is when his head is still. And now we're going to see what his vision is when his head is moving. So when I click on Start, when I click on Start, I just want you to sit really still while I give you some instructions, OK? I'm going to click on Start, and I can choose to practice just the head movement or the dynamic visual acuity test. So I'm going to start with just the head movement. The purple dot in the center, Jason, is your head. The 20s on either side of that are the amplitude that I want your head to move. So just turn your head till you hit that. Good. And the other way? Great. Just do that a few times. Wonderful. Stop. Do I want him to practice this for 20 minutes before I start the test? No. Underneath that purple is the line that's going across that's indicating your velocity, your speed. So what I'd like you to do is move your head so that that bar turns green. And you want the, bar, the green bar to go between these two uprights, between the 85 and the 1 to the left of it and the 85 and the 1 to the right. OK. There you go. That's great speed. OK. A little bit more amplitude. There you go. A little bit more to the right. Great. Stop. Now, for my patients, a lot of my patients have had traumatic brain injury or they're older adults. He's a good patient because he learned the head movement really quickly. For my patients in my clinic, what I tend to do is help them with the head movement. I find that for my patients, if I help them during the test, that it takes that variable away. They don't have to worry about concentrating on their head movement. They only worry about seeing the optotype on the screen. So that's a clinical judgment call on your part. All right. So I'm going to exit out of this practice because he's got the head movement. And it's, I'm going to, the practice is still highlighted, so I'm going to click on Start. And I want to now practice the full DVA. So Jason, as soon as your head starts moving, it's, that's what triggers the start of the trial. So once your head starts moving and you feel like you've got the velocity and the amplitude, keep your eyes on that circle in the center of the screen, and E is going to appear there. And you're going to have to watch for the E while your head is moving. Does that make sense? OK, go ahead and start your head moving. Were you able to see it? Yes. Good. OK. So what you'll notice here is as the operator, you get a green bar or a red bar. OK? The green bar means that he was within the threshold velocity. 
for in this case, the threshold is between 85 and 120 degrees per second. And you'll see that his velocity was 98 degrees per second. Perfect. If he was moving too quickly, that bar would be red. You have to be careful. If your patients are moving their head too quickly, you could get some, some false positive results. They might not be seeing the optotype, but it might just be because they're moving their head too quickly. So it's our job as the operator to control the speed of his head movement, either by verbal cues or by um, manually moving his head. Okay. All right, you want to do one more? Just one more practice? Okay. All right. As soon as your head starts moving, that's what starts the trial. Great, and you see his velocity is perfect. If, so I would be coaching him, if he was a patient, I would be coaching him and letting him know that his velocity is good, keep that, that's what we're gonna keep for the rest of the, t of the test. It's really important that you remember that you're in practice mode, because if you forget you're in practice mode, you can go through a lot, a lot of practice and never actually start the test. Trust me, it's frustrating. So, I'm gonna exit out of practice mode, I'm hitting the escape key. I do not want to continue practice. I'm going to move on to the dynamic visual acuity test itself. This is another situation where I don't want you to guess. If you don't know, just say, I don't know. Okay? The computer is looking for consistency of results, and we need to make sure that he's not throwing things off by guessing correctly or incorrectly. I'm going to click the Start button. There's his cue. As soon as you start moving your head, we're starting the test whenever you're ready. Great. Now, do I want him to continue to move his head between trials? No. And he's doing great. He stopped as soon as the, the um, screen changed. He stopped his head movement. He said down. And you'll, you'll see that we're at 0.3 logmar, which is what? Three lines bigger than 2020. Great. Okay, now do you see the bar is red? Why? He's moving a little bit too quickly. He's moving at 127 degrees per second. So Jason, just slow your head movement down a tiny bit for next time, okay? Now here's an error message. What does it say? Low velocity detected. He wasn't moving quickly enough, so the computer didn't present the optotype because that would have been given him um, a chance maybe for his pursuit system or his psychotic system to cheat. So this is one of the big benefits of having a computerized version of this test. The patient cannot cheat. So I have an option here. What do I want to do? Do I want to start over? No. His test is going fine. I don't want to start over. I'm going to click on continue and coach him just a little bit quicker, Jason, okay? and your velocity is perfect. And we're at 0.0, .0 logmar right now, 2020. I don't know. Don't know, minus 0.3 logmar. That's, is that smaller or bigger than his static visual acuity? Smaller, so I don't expect him to be able to see that, right? He couldn't see it with his head still. I certainly don't expect him to see it with his head moving. I'll give him space bar for that. Good. And do you notice that sometimes the purple dot isn't exactly in the middle of the field? Okay. Sometimes the calibration on, on, the, um, on the head tracker gets a little bit off. You don't have to worry about that. It will reset itself on the next trial. But you do want to watch your patient to make sure they're still in midline, turning their head right to left. I couldn't even see that, and my head is still, so don't worry about it. Have you seen that some of the um, levels are repeating themselves? The computer is going to give Jason a lot of opportunities at each level because we don't know, the computer doesn't know if Jason blinked, sneezed, something else happened. So Jason gets a couple of different opportunities at each level. Jason also gets different, a couple opportunities to the left and to the right. So remember, the, compu so it, the test seems like it's long. It's because the computer has to give optotypes when, the, when his head's moving left and when his head's moving right. Okay, okay. Okay. All trials have been performed. Do I want to close the test? Yes. OK. 
Okay. I would put a comment in. How are you feeling? Great. Any dizziness? No. Any eye strain? No. Any headache? No. Any nausea? Awesome. Okay. Can you imagine, though, that your patients might feel any one or all of those symptoms at, during this test? Yes, and they do need quite a few breaks. So we're going to move on now to the gaze stabilization test. This test I do second because it's a little bit more complex for both the operator and the patient. Because what's happening in this test is the optotype is going to stay the same size throughout the test, but what's going to change is his head speed. For gaze stabilization, we can actually capture his maximum head speed while maintaining visual clarity. So for the vestibular therapist in the room, what does that translate to? The speed of the vestibular ocular reflex or the speed at which retinal slip occurs? And where do we, what speed do we give our, vi our VOR exercises at? Uh, the speed of retinal slip. So now we have the ability to capture that speed very precisely and give our patients a home program that's geared exactly toward their speed of retinal slip. Okay. So the instructions, Jason, for you are going to be, I want you to start moving your head slowly, gradually increase the speed, and when you hit the threshold velocity, the optotype will appear. As you move through the test, if you get the answer correctly, I'll cue you to go move your head more quickly because the next one will be faster head movement. If you get the answer wrong, I'll cue you to move your head more slowly because the speed requirement will decrease. Does that make sense? All right. And again, this would be another opportunity for me to help him with the head movement. Okay, so I'm going to get a practice for this after I hit the continue button. Again, it's critical that you do practice. Okay. We also, in gaze stabilization, we have the ability to adjust the minimum and maximum speed. So it defaults to a normal ADL requirement speed, which is 0 to 150 degrees per second. We know from the literature that to play successful singles tennis, you have to be able to see clearly with head movements up to about 150 degrees per second. If you are doing higher level sports, soccer, um, football, sports that require very rapid movement, rapid head movement and tracking of moving objects, we know that those speed requirements get up to 250, 280 degrees per second. So if Jason's a superhero, I can click on this button that says high performance and you'll see that the speed range changes from 70 to 300 degrees per second. Okay. Now, I know that he can see at 85 to 120 already, right? Because he passed the, the dynamic visual acuity test, or at least he was able to participate. But if his demand of his work and his life was really, really high, if he's a soccer player, if he's a football player, if he's a hockey player and requires a lot of visual ocular control, vestibular ocular control for his work or his life, I might choose to test him in the high performance range. Okay. I'm going to test him though in the normal range right now because there's a situation that occurs that I want to show you in case it occurs for you. We're going to practice, Jason. So what I want you to do is I'm going to go right to the GST because the head movement amplitude is the same. Start moving your head slowly, a little bit more amplitude. Great. Now, did you see how slow that head movement was? 50 degrees per second, which is quite a bit slower than the speed that we did the DVA at. The beautiful thing about this test is if your patient can't do the DVA because they can't move their head that quickly, you can still test them on the GST because you can drop the head speed down. This is really nice for older adults or people that have significant vestibular loss because you can, you can actually capture what speed they can still see. So you can identify functionally where are they going to have trouble with their ADLs. Okay. We're going to do one more. A little faster, a little bigger. 
Good for you. Did you see it? Okay, so you can see that this is hard because if I'm coaching him verbally, he's going to be listening to me and it's going to be harder for him to pay attention to the, to the optotype. Okay, do you think you need any more practice? Or are, you, are you good to go? Okay, so I'm going to get out of practice mode again. Do you want to continue practice? No. I'm going to move on to gaze stability. <coughs> And as soon as you start your head movement, that's what's going to start the trial. You ready? Yeah. Right. OK. Now, did he get it right? Did anybody see it? He got it right. OK. The bar is red. OK. I have an opportunity here. If he was moving his head too quickly and he got it wrong, it could be a false positive result. So I'm concerned if the bar is red and he got it wrong, I want to make sure it's not a false positive result. I, that might be a situation where I would go back and start over. Okay? He got it right, so I'm not concerned. So I'm going to click on the right arrow key, and we're going to move on to the next test, the next trial. A little faster this time, Jason. Great. And did you see it jumped up? He got the first one right, so the speed jumped up to 90 degrees per second. Did he get this one right? Okay, so we're going to move. The next one's going to be a little faster. Okay. Great. Okay, take a break for a second. So 150 is the threshold maximum that we set because we're doing the normal performance range. But you'll see that he moved 176. The computer will still capture his velocity. So we're not capped at 150, um, which is nice. If he can go beyond that, the computer will capture that data. But he missed that one, so I have to give him a space bar. So this one will be a little slower. <laughs> so again, he's not able to cheat. Okay, The computer will not let him cheat. And we're finished with the gay stability test. So I do want to talk about Jason's results here before I give you guys some practice time. Um, I'm going to close this test. Yes, I would put Jason feels great in my comment section. And then when I go to analysis, I'm going to look and see what his results are. So I want to look first at perception time. I want to remember what his perception time was. It was 20 milliseconds. This is a critical piece for your testing. If the patient scores 60 milliseconds or slower on perception time, it's not recommended that you go on and complete the rest of the InVision protocol because the optotype will be on the screen for so long that your patient will be able to cheat using visual pursuits or visual saccades. If your patient scores 60 milliseconds or slower, it's recommended that you go back and immediately repeat perception time because there could be a learning effect there. Give them another shot at perception time. If they still can't get it to the 0 to 50, then I wouldn't recommend moving on to the rest of the InVision protocol. Um, some of your patients, um, a lot of the patients that are coming back with blast injuries have very, very long perception times. So we don't go on and retest them. So his perception time is great, 20 milliseconds. Then we moved on to the dynamic visual acuity test. Does anybody know what a normal result for dynamic visual acuity is? Two line loss or less is considered normal. So if we're looking at Logmar, on his, when he sw swept to the left side, he lost 0.22 Logmar. How many lines is that? 2.2. Is that a normal result? Slightly, you know, slightly abnormal, right? Um, so what would make me concerned about this result? If he was symptomatic, exactly. If he's symptomatic and has this result, I would take it much more seriously than if he's not symptomatic, okay? How do you do on the right? He lost only one line with head movement to the right, which is well within the normal and expected. So if he lost 2.2 lines to the left and only one to the right, 
when I move to gauge stability testing, what do I expect his speeds to be on the left compared to, to the right? Do I expect him to be able to move his head faster to the left or slower to the left? Slower to the left. Okay, well, let's see if our results agree. And they do. So he moved his head slower to the left than he did to the right. So this test, when you have this kind of agreement, this is a really nice baseline for your patients because now I know that he can only move his head 136 degrees per second to the left and still maintain his visual clarity. Where am I going to start him on his VOR exercises? What speed? 136, which is a lot more specific than Turn your head until you, right? I mean, this is what we do today, and, and our patients get better, but this gives us a lot more control over that home exercise. How do you set this, how do you have them practice? Do, do metronomes correlate one to one with degrees per second? No, why? What are the factors that work into that? Okay, so you've got acceleration and deceleration. You also have amplitude variations, right? Is your patient a robot and they're going to move exactly 20 degrees per second? Right, they're, they're not. So how do we set up a practice for our patient? So you can use it and you can work with them at home. You can put them in gaze stability practice, set the speed while they're working that speed, you take your metronome. Does anybody have a metronome app on their phone? Yeah, right, they're free. You find them everywhere. You're not going to set the metronome at the exact speed of the GST. What are you going to set the metronome for? Who do you have sitting in front of you practicing? The patient. So you're going to set the metronome based on the patient, and then you're going to send the patient home with that metronome and with that exercise. Does that make sense? So it gives you a lot more control over the home program.